Hello, this is Dean McDonald from Tech Skills. In the first part of this two-part series, I will be removing a pin grid array or PGA processor from a zero insertion force processor slot. Let's get started. Since I will be opening computer cases and removing components, I need to make sure I use some sort of anti-static protection. In this case, I'll use an anti-static wrist strap. Put that on my wrist to make sure that the wrist strap is tight. This is connected to an ESD mat also has a grounding wire that's connected to a grounded outlet. Now I'll show you a computer case with a PGA processor and also a zero insertion force or ZIF processor socket. This is probably the most common type of processor and socket form factor that you find. Generally the processor is in the middle towards the top of the motherboard. This one happens to have a, a heat sink and fan assembly. They're generally square. Some of the heat sinks and fans can be rectangular. Some of them have two fans, some of them have three fans. Some of these might be water cooled, but generally the processor will be near the RAM and above the any of the expansion cards and then right next to any of the integrated components that are on the motherboard. So I'm going to go through the process of removing some of these components so we can get a clear view and then also removing the heat sink and fan and then replacing it and putting it back in the machine. To make more room inside my case to work, I will remove all the bulky floppy and IDE ribbon cables as well as all the power leads coming from the power supply. First I'll remove the ribbon cable from the floppy drive. That's this device right here. To do that I grip onto the cable as close to the ribbon cable controller as I can and I'll just pull straight back from the device trying not to twist or turn it. Then I can trace the cable down to the motherboard and repeat that same process. So the motherboard connector goes perpendicular into the board. I'll just grip onto the ribbon cable, pull it straight out of the board, and then I can remove and set that cable aside. Now I can remove the power cable to the floppy controller and also the, the Molex power connector to the hard drive and to my first CD-ROM and the second CD-ROM. Now I have access to all the other ribbon cables for my hard drive. First CD-ROM and the second CD-ROM. Now I can remove these from the motherboard. be able to remove the ATX power supply connector. Can't get my fingers in there between the ATX power connector and the RAM so I need to remove the RAM so I can make a little bit of room. RAM is held in place by those plastic tabs so I just press the plastic tab down. Same thing goes for the top and then that re replaces or removes the RAM. As I remove the RAM, I'll place it inside an anti-static bag until I reinstall it back into the machine. To remove the other RAM, press the locking tab on the bottom and then on the top. And then the RAM chip comes out and I can place it in the anti-static bag also. Now I can remove the ATX power supply connector and then I can tuck these cables up and out of the way. With the bulky floppy and IDE controller cables and the power supply cables out of the way I have clear un unobstructed view of the processor. I need to be able to get to this locking clip here so now I will be able to remove the locking clip, remove the heat sink and fan assembly and then I'll show you how to remove the processor. This heat sink has a fan which is plugged in with this three plug wire. It's plugged into the motherboard down here. I'll remove that so when I remove the heat sink and fan I can remove it without catching that wire. To remove the heat sink and fan I lay the computer case on its side. 
I need to have access to this locking clip. There's a spring clip that connects over here to a little plastic tab on the processor socket. There's also a metal connector over here which connects to a plastic tab. Some of these you can use a screwdriver, some of these you can use your fingers. This one I happen to be able to use both. In this case I could stick a screwdriver down here in the slot and push it down. I can also use my fingers. To remove the spring clip, I press the spring clip down and then I flex my fingers or press the spring clip away from that locking tab. So you can see this plastic tab right here that held the spring clip in place. On the other side of the processor is the spring clip. There's a plastic tab that holds in the metal spring clip. I can use my fingers to remove that spring clip. Now I should be able to remove the heat sink and fan assembly. Some of these heat sinks and fans are bonded to or connected to the processor. So you may need to either heat them up or very carefully twist them side to side so you can remove the heat sink and fan. On the bottom of this heat sink you can see some thermal grease. This one happens to have a thermal pad on it. And in the center there you can see where the processor was. The processor also has a small bit of thermal grease on it. If I were to replace the heat sink and fan assembly I would want to make sure that I cleaned off any of the thermal grease that's on the processor or on the heat sink. You can use isopropyl alcohol to remove that. You can scrape it with a plastic scraper. You can use cotton swabs to remove it. Then once you removed it, you would want to replace it with a, some sort of thermal compound. This one happens to be made from a silicone base. It also has zinc oxide. You can find some that have silver. The high-end ones have silver. They're a little bit more expensive generally work for high-end use. I use the silicone base ones for everyday processors. In this case I will be just replacing the same CPU fan and a heat sink assembly that I had on it so I'm not going to be putting any new compound on. Since this one did have a thermal pad I wouldn't want to mix and match and put this on top of it. You want to use one or the other. So in this case, I'm just going to be putting this heat sink and fan assembly back on the processor. With the heat sink and fan removed, I can look at the processor. They'll generally have some markings on them to indicate who made them. In this case, we have an Intel processor. Maybe what type they are. This one says Celeron. And then it has some markings on here. It says 700. That means it's a 700 megahertz. It says 128. That's the size of the cache memory, the L1 cache. It says 66, that's the bus speed that this runs at, and then it says 1.45 volts. So this is a 1.45 volt Celeron 700 megahertz processor. To remove a PGA processor, there's a little lever that holds the processor in place. There's generally a little locking tab. So you need to get your finger down there, pull the bar out to the side around that locking tab, and then you can lift the lever to loosen the processor and then generally you have to lift it all the way up to release it. With the lever all the way up you should be able to reach in and just pull that processor out of the slot. Here's the bottom of a processor. You can see the pin grid array. You have to be very careful handling these PGA processors. These pins are very delicate. So you want to make sure you hold them only by the edge and then when you're not using them, make sure they go inside an anti-static bag. As with processors, the zero insertion force or ZIF sockets might have some markings on it to indicate what type they are. This one says PGA370, so this holds a PGA370 processor, so that means there's 370 pins. Those are some of your Celeron, some of your Pentium 3 processors.